Score more by bowling with Nelson Burton, Jr. It's more effective than the leading men's deodorant. It's been proven better in clinical tests at blocking odor. It's Old Spice Fast Track Wide Deodorant. It blocks odor better. The popularity of Boeing has reached new heights with over 10 million men, women, and children Boeing and American Boeing Congress League competition. Yet no one has paid attention to the special needs of the league player. This video is for you with the answers you've been looking for to add points to your average. In addition to improving your game on the lanes, I have some helpful tips to help you before you go bowling and a special section on how to maximize your practice time. Now, let's get on with the action. I just can't seem to find the pocket. Well, I start out all right, but by the end of the league, I just goes downhill. Hey, group. Hey, you know, that's a problem that all bowlers have, and that's really finding their strike line week after week, and then as Karen, her problem of maintaining it all through a league session. And there's a fairly simple solution to this problem. Watch this and learn. I normally use the second arrow as my target on the lane, and the center dot is my spot on the approach for my strike line. Now let's see how it works on this lane. This red line designates my starting point. I rolled a quality shot over the second arrow, but the ball failed to come up to the pocket. I missed the head pin to the right. Now what do I do? Well, the golden rule of bowling says, if you miss to the right, move to the right. But the key is how much. Here's what the pros do. When they miss to the right, they move three boards to the right on the approach and one board to the right on the lane. If this adjustment works, fine. If that shot doesn't come up to the head pin, I move an additional board to the right on the lane and another three boards to the right on the approach. You keep doing this until you have enough angle of attack towards the pocket to cover that tight lane or slick lane. Now the opposite is true if you come in and the lane's hooking too much. Let's say I roll the ball over the second arrow again on my first shot. The ball hooks wildly to the left side of the head pin. Once again, you move the direction that the ball misses. I missed left, so I must move left. Back to the golden rule. Move three boards to the left on the approach and one on the lane. If the ball doesn't come in the pocket at this point, an additional three boards to the left on the approach and another board on the lane. You keep making these adjustments, even if you have to play an extreme inside line, until you finally get the ball in the pocket on the dry lane. So remember the rule. If you miss right, move right. If you miss left, move left. But the increments are three boards on the approach to one on the lane. To solve some problems, we're going inside the pro shop. Later, we're going to take you inside the making of a bowling ball. Other than a player's natural ability, probably the most important ingredient in his game is his equipment. Now, bowling balls have come a long way since the wooden balls of the 1890s and 1900s. And there are three factors that you must consider when purchasing a bowling ball. Number one, the weight. Number two, the grip. And number three, the type. Now the weight. Bowling pins weigh somewhere between three pounds, six ounces, and three pounds, 12 ounces. So those 10 pins 60 feet away weigh almost 35 pounds. Now what's most effective? Obviously the most weight you can use and still maintain control and accuracy. Now 16 pound ball is what most of the pros use. Now for you, if you can't keep your speed up or you're losing accuracy, don't be afraid to drop from the 16-pound ball down to, say, the 14, 12, or even to a lighter ball. Now, second, the grip. The grip, there are three basic types of grips. Number one, the conventional grip, where the fingers are inserted down to the second knuckles in the finger holes. Then the semi-fingertip grip, 
where the fingers are inserted between the first and second knuckles in the finger holes. And finally, a grip that some of the pros use, the fingertip grip. Now, what do I feel is most effective? It's basically the semi-fingertip grip. Why? You can keep your hand underneath the ball as you should and hold it very simply this way. You have good control and accuracy. You have the power to hold on to the bowling ball and yet ease of release. And don't forget, if you don't like your grip in the ball or you don't have a semi-fingertip grip, you can plug the bowling ball up. You can fill the holes up, have your pro shop man do that, redrill it, and it's good as new. And finally, the type of bowling ball. Three types of bowling balls. Number one, the rubber ball, which we saw come into being around 1900 to around the 1960s. Now, this was a great bowling ball for the lacquer surfaces we saw up until around 1965. What happened then, the manufacturers start putting urethane on the bowling lanes, the plastic ball came into being. This was more compatible to the lane surface because the rubber ball wasn't very effective. And finally, the best ball of them all came out around 1980, and that's called the urethane or polyurethane bowling ball. Now, why is this so much better? Number one, it has the durability of the rubber ball, has the flexibility of the plastic ball, but it has the power hitting that neither one of these balls have ever had before, and this is the best type of ball for your game. So remember, grip, work with the semi-fingertip, use a weight you can control, plug your bowling ball if you don't like exactly the type of grip you have, and finally, invest in a urethane ball. If you've ever experienced problems of sticking at the line or slipping across the foul line, you know how frustrating it can be to have improper footwear. Many people make the mistake of not buying proper bowling shoes when they are buying bowling equipment. Now let's take a look at the bowling shoes. First, the house shoes are rental shoes. They're not too bad except there's one major drawback. They're made for both lefties and righties and they have slide soles on both shoes. This doesn't allow you to effectively get a good lift on the bowling ball. What I recommend is a pair of custom shoes. For you left-handers, just transpose what I'm about to say. First, let's take a look at the right shoe, or the traction shoe. This shoe gives you stability all the way to the foul line, especially on that second to last step, or that pivot step, where you have to push off the tip of this right sole to get the power on the bowling ball. Second, the sliding sole. As you notice, there's a smooth, perforated sliding sole on this left foot it gives you a smooth transition all the way to the foul line every time. So remember, if your problem is with the approach, invest in a good pair of bowling shoes. As you can see in the pro shop, there are a number of accessories available to the bowler to improve his game. We've already picked out a good pair of bowling shoes. We've already picked out an effective bowling ball. Now the last thing to consider is good accessories. First, the glove type. There's gloves to help you hold on to the bowling ball other gloves to help you feel the palm around the bowling ball, and other gloves to help you keep your wrist and hand in the proper position. The wrist devices are probably the most effective of all the gloves. Simply this, they hold the ball in the proper position throughout the swing, especially you women. You have a tendency to push the bowling ball away into the swing, break the wrist backwards in the swing, and that causes an ineffective roll on the bowling ball. And last, consider some of these other things. Rosin to help you hold on to the bowling ball, tape, scissors to keep the holes feeling the right size. It's good to have a wire brush available to keep the soles of your shoes clean. And finally, carry some cotton and clothing in case you develop a blister or cut in your hand and you'll always be ready to go. Remember, don't let your ability be shortchanged by your equipment. Now back to the lanes. As you watch these top pros, it's evident there are a number of different styles. However, the fundamentals are the same when it comes to the approach. In this segment, we're going to take an in-depth look at the approach. Over the years, I've seen league bowlers constantly making the same mistakes. But before we can address those mistakes and correct them, we need to look at the approach style. Now, most players take a four or even a five-step delivery. Which do I think is best? The five-step delivery. The reason being is that it is the best for today's lane conditions. It gives you more power and more speed for more score. Consider this. If a player just took one step, 
he'd have less mechanical errors, but no momentum on the ball. If he took six, seven, or eight steps, he'd have plenty of momentum, but a lot of margin for error. With that in mind, let's take a look at the approach. The four-step approach was taught by most pros because it was an easy way to coordinate both hand and foot motion into a simple yet effective attack. Now let's look at the five-step delivery. What the additional step gives us is the extra momentum that adds 10 to 15 percent more power to the resulting throw. Now, as I said, there are plenty of pitfalls that the league bowler can get into. So let's look at those mistakes step by step. The first step is the momentum step. The two common mistakes are taking too short a first step, which effectively does nothing to add to your approach, or you can take too long a first step. This will cramp your next step, the push away, and get you moving too quickly to the line. The second step is the push away. For you four steppers, this will be your first step. The critical error here is not to push the ball away along your target line. By pushing the ball away to the left of your body, you will be forced to swing the ball wide of your body. Or if your push away goes to the right, then your backswing will be into your body. It is important to stay on the straight line towards your target. The next step is the downswing. It's at this point that bad habits can really be exposed. Many people will allow the weight of the ball to drop their shoulder, again taking them out of proper alignment for attacking the pins. Also at this point, many people will break their wrist. The ball will be out of proper position of having the ball in the palm of their hand. Eventually, this will mean that your power will only be generated by the wrist instead of by your arm and shoulder. The next step, the pivot step, is the most important point in your delivery. This is your last chance to make adjustments in the speed of the ball, either faster or slower. This happens as you change from the backward motion of the ball to the forward motion. But the most critical point is the planting of your pivot foot. This is where good shoes really help to avoid slipping and add to your power surge. The last step is a sliding step and follow through. As I mentioned before, the broken wrist will cause a weakness at the release point since you'll be behind the ball instead of under the ball, causing a loss of effectiveness. The follow through must stay on line because any twists or turns at this point will cause the ball to go off your intended line. And most importantly here is the position of the hips with your slide and release. If the hips come through too early, it will make you throw the ball to the left or pull the shot. If the hips come through late, it will cause you to open up your stance and make your throw go to the right of the pocket. We've already seen the approach from a number of different angles. However, today, with the help of this sports training mirror, you're going to see the approach in an entirely different manner. Remember the first time you heard your voice on a tape recorder? You may not even have recognized it as your own. The same is true with your bowling style. You may have never seen yourself bowl, but with this mirror, you can watch yourself bowl and make corrections in your arm swing, your push away, and your approach. Now let's take a look at this mirror. You see the vertical line? That represents my arm swing. The crosshair is where the vertical and horizontal line meet. That represents my push away. And finally, those two little red dolls right around the second arrow represent my intended trajectory towards the pocket. Let's see how it works. Later, I'll show you how to use a mirror at home to improve your style. Now I'm going to show you how the sports mirror can be used to detect flaws in your game. On this next shot, I'm going to intentionally drop my right shoulder. This will cause an errant arm swing with the result of the ball going way to the right. Watch how it works. Now let's take one more look 
at the proper position throughout the entire approach. Step one, the momentum step. Step two, the push away. Step three, the downswing. Step four, the pivot step. Step five, the slide and follow through. I've never seen a good bowler who wasn't an excellent spare maker. In this section, we're going to deal with spares and some common splits. The first group is head pin down spares, with a few exceptions to that rule. The second group of spares we shoot are the head pin standing spares. And finally, we're going to deal with some common splits. So, watch this action. In this segment, we're going to deal with one of the most important parts of the bowling game and that's making spares with the head pinned down. Now, there are a couple of things you must consider. Number one, your spot on the approach, and number two, your mark out on the lane. Now, the golden rule of spare making says, if there's a spare on the left side of the lane, move to the right side of the approach. If there's a spare on the right side of the lane, move to the left side of the approach. Now, with the help of the third arrow from the right-hand channel for right-handed bowlers, and the third arrow from the left-hand channel for left-handed bowlers, you can convert every spare with a head pin down. Consider this. Here's my strike mark on the approach, right about the center of the lane. I have left the seven pin, which is actually hidden behind this mirror, over in the left-hand corner of the lane. So using a third arrow, moving to the right side of the approach, I should make this spare every single time. I've just added the four pin with the seven pin. Now the spare making rule for head pin down spares is so simple that it, all you have to do is move three boards to the left on the approach towards the four pin and use the same spare target, the third arrow on the lane. Watch this. I've added the two pin to the four seven. Now I have the two four and seven pins combination. You still use the third arrow from the right hand channel for head pin down spares and move an additional three boards towards the center of the lane. Remember, as each succeeding pin moves towards the center of the lane, the body moves towards the center of the lane. Watch how you make this. Let's take a look at this diagram. Often people take a straight angle of attack and this maximizes the margin for error. To increase your spare making percentages, use an angle of attack across the lane and you'll see your scores improve. Remember, don't take a chance of rolling the ball on the channel when it's easier to make spares rolling across the lane. We've already seen how to attack the two, four, and seven pin combinations on the left side of the lane. Now we must worry about the three, six, and 10 pin combinations on the right side of the lane. Now our target arrow is the exactly the same for all those spares, the third arrow from the right hand channel. What you must do is establish your position on the approach for the 10 pin first. That means move the extreme left side of the approach, roll the ball over the third arrow. Once you have established that spot, remember it because all the rest of the spares come off that spot. Use the third arrow, stand on the left-hand side of the approach, and now you've established your number one position for spares on the right-hand side of the lane. Now if you leave the 6-10 combination, move three boards towards the center of the lane off your 10-pin spot on the approach. You left-handers, remember, use the third arrow from the left side. Right-handers, this is your number two position. Here it is. Stand over three boards to the right from off your 10-pin mark on the approach. Once again, the constant of the third arrow, and you've established your number two position for spares on the right-hand part of the lane. 
Now, if you leave the 3, 6, and 10, or any combination of the 3, 6, 10, move an additional three boards to the right on the approach, and now you've figured out how to convert all the spares on the right and all spares on the left using the third arrow. Position number three, the final position on the left-hand side of the approach. Use the third arrow, and you'll convert all the spares with the three pin standing. The next group of spares we deal with are head pin standing spares. Basically spares like the 128, the 124. Now this is the simplest group of spares to make and a very simple rule to follow to convert these spares. All that you have to do is move five boards to the right on the approach from your original strike stance on the approach, roll the ball over the target you were using for the strike. That'll move the ball to the one two side of the head pin and convert all these spares. You treat the target on the lane the same as the strike shot and make a five board to the right move on the approach. This gives you enough angle of attack to get the ball to the left side of the head pin. There are two common exceptions to the spare making rule. Number one, the two, four, five combination. In order to make this, move to the extreme left side of the approach, roll a ball over on the left side of the lane where a left hander would shoot and throw a ball straight into the two pin. This will avoid the chop, making the two, four, and five. The gamble of moving to the left side of the lane to avoid the chop is well worth the reward on this very tough spare. Now the other combination we deal with takes a little bit different angle of attack. It's the three, six, nine, ten. A common spare, but very difficult to make. What you must do is stand in your strike zone and throw the ball out around the first arrow so you get a big hook into the three, six, nine combination. That way you can carry out the nine pin and make the spare more often. Use your strike position on the approach, then trust your shot on the extreme outside line. Even though you may chop the spare once in a while, you still have a better chance of conversion because of the double wood nine pin. It is the key. While most spares are fairly simple to make if you employ the proper techniques, split making is a little bit different story. Now to increase your scoring, you need to increase your split making percentage. This next little segment will give you some tips to help you do that. The most common pocket split is the 5-7. To convert the 5-7 split, move three boards to the left on the approach from your strike position and use your strike target on the lane. The most common non-pocket split is the baby split, or 310. To convert the 310 split, move to the left side of the approach, roll the ball over the third arrow to hit the right side of the 3-pin, and the ball will deflect into the 10-pin. The 1, 2, 4, and 10 pins, better known as the washout. Now normally when we leave the head pin standing, we move five boards to the right on the approach and use the same strike target out at the arrows. But the 10 pin adds a new dimension. You have to get the head pin over to knock out the 10 pin. So you need more angle of attack to throw the head pin towards the 10 pin. So instead of moving five boards on the approach, you move seven boards to the right on the approach from your original strike stance. Watch this. Move seven boards to the right on the approach. Use your strike target and your strike release. Roll the ball to the left side of the head pin. Let that number one pin do the work on the 10 pin. The seven and 10 pins, a near impossible split. But there's two ways to look at this combination. Number one, if it's late in a match, you may want to go for one pin, the 10 or the seven, whichever is easier for you. But if it's early in the match, a different strategy comes into play. Try what the pros do. They try to adjust their strike spot, give up the one pin, and hopefully they'll be in the pocket for the remainder of the game. Watch this.
ladies and gentlemen, just one more, and that couple, the McCordicks of Houston, Texas, will be $100,000 richer. Well, we gave away $100,000 in the U.S. Open just four weeks ago to another Texan, Dell Ballard Jr., Pete McCordick, Boeing Immortality. Is that a sight, Bo? Within his grasp, one more strike. 1974, Jim Stefanich was the last time. All right, here it is. Right lane. Pressure. As your bowling game improves, you're going to find yourself getting into situations where you feel a little bit uncomfortable. You may need a strike to win a team game, you may need a spare to set a personal high, and you become nervous. Now, most players mess up in a situation like this, but I have a couple of little tips that will give you a better chance to perform under pressure. Number one, keep your eyes riveted on that target arrow until your ball hits the pins. Your teammates will let you know if you were successful or not. And secondly, most players have a tendency to pull the ball towards the head pin under pressure. So concentrate on the inside of your elbow, not your hand, your inside of your elbow following through to that target arrow. That way, you won't pull the ball high in a pressure situation. Let's take a moment to consider some other factors in our sport. For instance, the lonely single pin. Most players have a tendency to tighten up and force their aim when they see a single pin because it looks so small 60 feet away. But let's take a look at this graphic. When you realize that you have almost a two foot margin of error to tap the pin on either side, you should loosen up and armed with this knowledge, have a much better chance of making single pin spares. Team strategy or how to organize your team lineup is a facet of our sport that very few people deal with, yet we're all league players. Over the years, I put together three World's Championship American Bowling Congress teams, and I have found a formula that is a winning combination. And here it is. In the leadoff spot, put your very best player. He'll find the line to the pocket for the rest of the team. In the second and third positions, Put the players that just like to have fun. Keep them freewheeling in that position. In the number four position, put your best practice player. He'll be dependable in that spot. And in the anchor position, or number five position, put your power player, who is normally your best clutch player. He'll perform on the very last shot to win a lot of games. Now, armed with this formula, your team should go on to win more games this year. Now, here are some rules you must know in order to be a competitive league or tournament player. A number of confusing situations often arise in league play, and I find that bowlers are not aware of the American Bowling Congress rulings dealing with each one of these cases. Let's take a look at a few of these situations. First, a player bowls on the wrong lane. What do you do? Well, if you bowl on the wrong lane, you must not count that frame and return over to the proper lane and roll the frame. What if a player rolls and all the pins were not set up? This is known as a dead ball ruling. The player gets nothing for that frame and must reshoot the frame with no penalty. Now what happens if a player puts talcum powder on his bowling ball or rosin on his ball? You must wipe all foreign substances off the outside edge of the ball before you can roll it. You can leave no substance on the ball or anything that may come off on the lane surface. And finally, the foul rule. Most people are aware that if their foot crosses the foul line or their buzzer goes off, they receive zero for that shot. But what they don't realize is that the foul line extends from the floor all the way to the ceiling and from wall to wall. If a player crosses the foul line 
and touches the wall with his hand, that's a foul. Even though his foot didn't go over the line, that's still a foul. So remember, anything that touches over that invisible barrier of the foul line is considered zero for that shot, so be aware. Most bowlers don't get enough practice, and when they do, they don't know how to take advantage of this valuable time on the lane. How much practice do you think you need to improve your game? My experience has shown me that if you bowl one league competition and four quality games of practice each week, anybody will make dramatic improvements in their game. Golfers have an established plan of attack for their practice sessions. Driving, medium shots, short irons, and especially shots like sand shots and putting. Bowlers, too, can maximize the value of their practice time by applying specific techniques to each game. I recommend this simple four-game practice formula. In game number one, warm up eight to ten shots to get the proper timing and rhythm. In game number two, we look for flexibility of the strike line. In game three, accuracy, 95% of all ball sports. Game four, consistency. Game one. The object of the first game is to get physically warmed up with some easy throws and gradually adding speed with power to each succeeding shot. At the same time, reading the lane and making your adjustments for the proper strike line. Game two. We've taught you how to move or adjust your strike line to the extreme inside and outside lines. Now in game two, we want you to bowl the first five frames on the extreme outside line around the first arrow so you become comfortable with this angle when you find it necessary to play. For the last five frames, play the third arrow or the extreme inside line, again to ensure that you're comfortable when working from this position. In game three, work on accuracy and discipline of arm swing. Try playing a game that the pros play called low ball. What you do is shoot for the seven pin on the first shot if you convert that, try for the 10-pin on the second shot. Try to lower your score each time out. A perfect game would be 20. In game number four, I issue you a challenge. I have a mirror to block my view of the pins. The biggest mistake anybody makes under pressure is to pull their eyes off the target and look up to see the result before they ever release the ball. Now keep your eyes on the target, not at the pins, on every single shot. Remember, good practice habits lead to better competitive scoring. While you're away from the lanes, or even at home, there are a number of things you can do to improve your bowling game. Specifically, work on your physical game. I'm going to show you some exercises that both men and women can do that will improve their bowling game. First, we'll work on the upper body. I like to take a gripper similar to this that has some tension in it, and on a daily basis, I squeeze it 30, 40 times, enough to make my hand and forearm tired. This will improve the strength in your hand, wrist, and forearm which will allow you to put more power on the ball at the release point. Now, if you don't have a gripper like that, try a rubber ball or even a tennis ball. Everybody's got a tennis ball around the house. Do the same thing. Squeeze it until your hand gets a little bit tired. This will improve your strength. And now the second part of the physical game is the legs. I like to use a jump rope. I jump rope on a daily basis, 400, 500 times. It takes four or five minutes and with an exercise like this, you stimulate your heart, your vascular system, and improve your leg strength. If you don't like to jump rope, consider running, jogging, or even some long distance walking. This will improve your leg strength for bowling. Now on league day, 
I'll show you an exercise routine that I always did in preparation for the professional bowler's tour. First, we'll work with the lower part of the body, the legs. Do some deep knee bends, such as this, to stretch out that left leg, that left knee. Also, at the same time, stretching the right interior part of your leg. Now do it on the opposite side. Bend way down as far as you can go, stretching the right knee out in the inside of the left leg. Hold that position for three or four seconds if you can. Now for the all-important hamstring muscles in the back. You don't want to stick at the foul line and pull a hamstring, so you should loosen those up by trying to touch your toes without bending your knees and hold that position for about five seconds like this. Now, we have the lower part of the body loosened up. How about the upper part of the body, the release part of the body in the sport of bowling? Stretch out those arms. Take your left hand, pull your right elbow up near your right ear. Stretch it out. The whole upper part of your body and chest stretches out. Now for the left side. Do the same thing. Stretch that left side out. Now your body's pretty well warmed up where you won't pull a muscle in bowling. Now I'll show you one other little trick that'll help you for your league bowling and that's how to use your own bowling lane at home. To their frustration, most bowlers don't get enough warm-up before league play. I devised a simple and safe solution to this problem. You can also practice at home using this method. Do this. Take a chair and place it up against the wall. Then get a pillow and put it on the chair to buffer the action of the bowling ball. Now you're set to warm up with maybe a dozen shots, and you can also practice that all-important fourth and fifth steps, the pivot step and the release. Watch this. While you're taking your warm-up shots, you can also adjust your thumb hole or finger holes for that proper field. Put a piece of tape or two in the holes if they're too loose. Take a piece or two out if they're too tight. Remember, this is warm-up for league play. I'm going to show you a way you can practice your approach away from the bowling center. Obtain a light ball about the size of a bowling ball. Get set up and do this with me. Work on that approach. Concentrate on the key points of your delivery. Get it where you memorize it every time. The good short first step, the arm swing close to your body, the long extended follow through with a nice steady head. Now, electronically, we're going to flip my image so that you lefties can practice with me. The fundamentals are exactly the same. Arm swing close to your body, nice smooth follow through, concentration. And finally, let's go through it step by step. Step one, short, step two, the push away, three, down swing, good arm swing, and finally release and follow through position. Remember how we use the mirror on the lane to check our arm swing and shoulder alignment? Well, you can create your own practice session at home with an ordinary mirror and some tape. What you need to do is put some tape vertically to indicate your arm swing, some more tape horizontally to check your shoulder alignment, and where the two meet is your push away zone. Now watch this. Working with the mirror at home is an effective method of monitoring your style. With this tape, you've made a valuable investment and added an important tool to your bowling equipment. You've increased your ability and knowledge of the sport, so now you have a solid foundation for upward and continued enjoyment of the game. If you follow the basics we've outlined in this video, you are now armed with all the tools to maximize your bowling talent. So good luck as you make the necessary adjustments and realize all your bowling potential. Different bowlers use different bowling balls. Now let's take a look at how a bowling ball is constructed. The following is the construction of a three-piece bowling ball. The components are the weight block, the core, and finally the outside cover or cover stock. Some balls are two-piece construction, made of just core and outer stock. 
This is the weight block. This block is precasted using heavier, more dense material. It is then placed in a core mold. Now the process of the core can begin. Once in the core mold, this mold is filled with a lighter material for a finished core. Four hours later, the mold is taken off the core. The core is cured in the rough state with a knob on top, the weight block on the bottom. Now the core can be ground into a round sphere. The process is repeated in a larger mold to add the outer shell. It is now a solid bowling ball. As you can see, it has a knob on it. The rough bowling ball is taken to the finishing area, where it is ground into a round spear. The balls go to the buffing station, where they are automatically buffed and cleaned. They are ground for a final time. The ball goes through a series of quality checks, consisting of a balance check, a roundness check, and a check for any other defects. Finally, a computer checks for a tolerance of plus or minus one one thousandths of an inch roundness. And finally, surface roughness is checked. The ball is weighed for gross weight and top weight. It's now boxed up and ready to be shipped to you. What kind of man whistled the Old Spice tune? He's my daddy. My pr-